This is, I think, a recipe for good health today is following the example of the traditional diets. So first was no refined or denatured foods. So not a lot of things in plastic bags with bright colors. Or they were also extremely nutrient dense. This was Dr. Price's key finding. They had four times the calcium and water-soluble vitamins and minerals of the American diet of his day in the 1930s. So just imagine the difference now. Um, at least in the US, you all, we are overfed and undernourished. And if you manage grassland with animals properly, you're adding fertility, you're keeping the grass and those roots in the soil, that's keeping uh, really excellent mycorrhizal fungi activity underneath there, which helps store that carbon. And if you're storing more carbon in the soil, you're also storing more water in the soil. If we don't do that in Australia, in the southeast especially, we are rooted. Like, we are not going to have anything to eat. Every traditional diet included animal products, much to Dr. Price's surprise. He thought he would find some plant-based cultures, but he did not. And indeed, I will show you in just a moment what these animal products have to offer us that are so important for our health. So to undo it with good management practices also should not take that long. So we have the capacity to do that, but we have to go back to completely different practices. I think the average carbon or organic matter in soils in most Australian farmlands is like one to two percent. These people were properly nourished, and they had their diets had ten times the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins as a modern American diet of his day. How did Dr. Price know this? He actually sent samples back to his lab in Ohio for analysis. And he picked it apart because he wanted to know what did they get that we weren't getting anymore. Once it's frosted, nothing grows. So we're in what we now are calling the green drought. Even where we are up near Dalesford, you know, it's green, it's super green. But the, the grass is non-nutritious. It didn't grow in time to provide any nutrition to the animals. In terms of uh, the way you manage animals in a regenerative system, you know, you would have heard about Savory and Joel Salatin, a um, guy in America called Gabe Brown, uh, who wrote From Dirt to Soil. And what everybody in those, in those world is talking about is moving your animals frequently and maintaining ground cover at all time and deep grass systems. So grasslands actually have greater capacity to store carbon than most forests. And if you manage grassland with animals properly, you're adding fertility keeping the grass and those roots in the soil, that's keeping uh, really excellent mycorrhizal fungi activity underneath there, which helps store that carbon. And if you're storing more carbon in the soil, you're also storing more water in the soil. If we don't do that in Australia, in the southeast especially, we are rooted. Like, we are not going to have anything to eat because it's raining less and we're storing less of it because of our treatment of soils. I don't know how much driving you've done through the Western District or up towards Mildura. They're apocalyptic. And if you haven't already read Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe, I strongly recommend you do. Because I've been in this country 28 years and I couldn't, couldn't get lenses for what, what it had been like before invasion. And Bruce gives you the lenses for it. You can see the, the young days as the fields have grown on. You can see that it wasn't just forest that's been destroyed. It was, it was vast grasslands and, and um, Murnong uh, lands. So it was a totally different thing and it held water. You know, they, they talk about Bill Gamage and he talk in their books about, about the um, horses up to their fetlocks in, um, in marsh and mold up in the Liverpool plains, which are in severe drought and don't hold any water anymore. So we have the capacity to do that, but we have to go back to completely different practices. I think the average carbon or organic matter um, in soils in most Australian farmlands is like 1% to 2%. And if you're over 5%, they're static. We had ours tested recently, we're at 
and so we're pretty excited about that, but we obviously have a ways to go. They say some of the soils in Australia would have had as much as 27% organic matter in them back in the day, before we wrecked them. And it didn't take us that long to wreck them, really. The, the invaders, you know, the colonials did that very early, and then we've just continued it. So to undo it with good management practices also should not take that long. But one of the things we say to farmers is like, don't do the whole stock for the worst year, and then as soon as there's a good year, restock. Actually, we right now going through what we are in climate change. We need to always stock for the first year. Our business models need to be built for the worst years, because we have to assume that every year now is the worst year. Like for us, that you hear farmers talk about the autumn break. Um, we love talking about the autumn break. <laughs> you know, where's the autumn break? Oh, autumn break hasn't come yet. So, oh, it's a bit late this year, and for us, it's getting later and later. And it's, and it's when the first rains come, and for us it's now like four to six weeks after the first frost in the central highlands. Once it's frosted, nothing grows. So we're in what we now are calling the green drought. Even where we are, up near Dalesford, you know, it's green, it's super green. But the, the grass is non-nutritious. It didn't grow in time to provide any nutrition to the animals. And so the only way you can avoid that is have less animals on it so it's not eaten down. So you can have that kind of 50% of, of dry standing matter as well as the shorter stuff. So not only have it down the ground and then the rains finally come and then it's mud and it's just destroyed. So these are the things that even your small scale farmers are grappling with. Uh, even though we're trying to do things right, it's really challenging for this climate. Um, and it's groups like the people here who care about you know, how your food is being grown and what you're putting in your bodies. You're all the ones who are in a position to sort of save these small scale farmers by choosing the farmers rather than choosing the multinationals. You know, we have, a, we have an ambition in our house to have no multinationals in our kitchen. And we're damn close, actually. <laughs> we have very few multinationals in our kitchen. Um, and, and our diet is, is joyful. You know, we sit down to three meals a day together. This is, I think, the Western A Price Foundation is being on this, you know, the same kind of thing that we are at John. I mean, you should enjoy your food together, you should cook your food together, you should grow as much of your own food as you can. You should share it with your friends. The friends that I'm staying with, I brought them a jar of ferments and a block of bacon. <laughs> That's why I bacon. Um, but it should be joyful and it shouldn't be from corporations who are trying to sell you something. It should be from somebody who's actually just your neighbor and making a livelihood from what they, from what they grow. And I think I'm going to actually stop there except to, um, uh, to just Quote somebody, um, Walter Yen is a soil biologist who spoke at Deep Winter, which is a gathering of small scale uh, farmers every year. And he talked about the soil carbon sponge. And I want you to kind of keep that in your head when you look out at Australian landscapes and you think about the farming practices getting the food to your plate. Can you see a soil carbon sponge? Can you see something that is able to absorb and hold water? Because that's the aim. That's what we need to be creating. All of the farmers out there need to be doing. And I can tell you that monocrops of non-diverse, non but the, we eat 66% of our diet comes from nine crops internationally, globally. That's disgraceful. And those systems do not have good soil carbon. They have a lot of NPK applied, and then they cut back down again, and they don't have root systems that maintain a, a healthy soil biology. So again, that's not where you want to get, you want to get from biodiverse farms that are doing things at small scale and trying to have as light a footprint on the land as we possibly can. Thanks a lot. Um, and actually, you remind me, um, kind of what the number one of Western Air Trust Foundation has kind of a few key aims. Um, one is education, but another one is to connect consumers and producers of um, nutrient dense nourishing foods. So that's a really biggie. And um, we, you know, actually send you all the sources and where you buy um, these great foods because we're putting them into a, a document that will be accessible on, online. For you know, I mean, it's going to be Australia wide because um, that's really that we really need to make it easy for people to find these foods and the farms to, to sell them so they can concentrate on their farm.
Then they told me I could do anything I wanted. And what did I want to do? I wanted to, you know, live fully. I wanted to have a strong, healthy body. And so I determined at a young age that I was going to be the best I could be. And then as I got older, I realized that I wanted to help other people do the same. And so at first, my thinking was exercise is medicine. And so I was just a fitness professional. Everybody worked out and it'll be all right. It doesn't matter what we eat. And then my best friend got sick with chronic fatigue and the doctors couldn't help her. And she tried all of these various diets, macrobiotic, vegetarian, nothing was improving her health, until she found out about the Western Christ Foundation and the idea that for good health today, we need to look to the past, to look for clues among what our ancestors ate, and her health began to improve. And so, so let me tell you who Western Christ is. He was this amazing dentist. He was actually originally from Canada. And he moved to Ohio, and he had a clinic, and he was taking care of all these small children in the 1930s and the 20s, and they had terrible teeth. They had dental deformities, the crowding of the teeth, and they had a lot of cavities, and corresponding behavior problems, and learning issues, and all these things. So he's treating these children, and at the same time as he's treating them, he's getting National Geographic magazine. Do you know that magazine? It has lovely pictures of people all around the world. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, and he saw these amazing indigenous people with these beautiful broad smiles. Of course, he's a dentist, so he's paying attention to the teeth. But they had these beautiful broad smiles, and they looked hale and hearty. And it was a stark contrast between the children and the people in his clinic and these people in the magazine. So he had two questions. Number one, do these people exist? Do these people really exist with these beautiful teeth and no dental deformities? And number two, if they do, what are they eating? So he decided at a time when it wasn't easy to do to take a trip around the world and to see for himself because he was a researcher, he was an anthropologist of sorts, he was very well respected in this time, he was writing numerous papers, and so he set out on this great quest. There he is. <laughs> and so he and his wife set out. I don't know if it was her idea to join him, but there they went by boat, by plane, everywhere they could. And they went all over the place. Switzerland, Alaska, Canada, Peru, Eastern Africa, Florida, and so on. And you see Australia is there. So I've been following in his footsteps, and it's been amazing to see the very things that Dr. Price saw. I mean, I haven't found indigenous groups isolated from modernity, but I have found people who are still close to their traditional ways, and it's been fascinating. So I've been to Peru, and I've been to Kenya, and now I'm in Australia. I can't believe I'm here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you some pictures of the things he found. So he visited this valley in Switzerland that you could only access by a very narrow footpath. So they were isolated from modern ways. And what do you think they were eating in Switzerland? Well, they were eating uh, probably meat, but yes, also a lot of dairy. Like this is. You know, the butter and the milk and the cheese, that was very heavily in their diet. And so what he would do was, he would examine the teeth of the villagers, and he would ask permission to document them. And these are pictures of some of the children. And their teeth were with very low incidence of cavities, if at all. Actually, their teeth, he noted, were covered by like this green slime. So they weren't brushing their teeth, and yet they didn't have cavities because their diet was so nutrient dense. It worked for the teeth and for their bodies. You can see here, they're barefoot in this little stream, and in the meantime, Dr. Price and his wife were shivering with heavy coats, but they were strong and healthy and well, and he also noted when he went around the world that the healthy indigenous people eating their traditional diets were optimistic and joyful. So these things all went hand in hand. Then he found modernized Swiss who had abandoned their traditional foods and were eating more refined flour and sugar and cottonseed oil and things like that. And inevitably, the children and the adults would suffer from tooth decay and deformities. And then the next generation in particular, he would note, would have all these conditions, these health conditions that came hand in hand with these dental issues. So he always says the teeth tell the tale. 
So when people have straight, beautiful teeth and few cavities, chances are they're going to have good posture and good hearing and good eyesight and the whole shebang. But if they don't, they tell the tale. Now in our modern day and age, we can wear braces, so you can't really tell who's healthy and who's not healthy. So we have the appearance on the outside of having good health. But inevitably, we're starting to have many chronic conditions that are caused by eating traditional diets. And this is where I'm going. This is, I think, a recipe for good health today is following the example of the traditional diets. So I'm not going to share with you every single pre principle from the Western Christ Foundation. There are 11. It's not that many. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight a few of the principles of traditional diets that all of the diets around the world had in common that Dr. Price saw. The first was no refined or denatured foods. So not a lot of things in plastic bags with bright colors or boxes that are labeled heart healthy. I, I think if they have those labels, it's the opposite. You should run in the opposite direction. Real food doesn't need such labels. Um, so yes, they didn't have the refined sugar, white flour, and so on. Every traditional diet included animal products, much to Dr. Price's surprise. He thought he would find some plant-based cultures, but he did not. And indeed, I will show you in just a moment what these animal products have to offer us that are so important for our health. Um, yes, a variety from seafood, birds, reptiles, mammals, insects, milk, and eggs, but they did have animal products. They were also extremely nutrient dense. This is Dr. Price's key finding. They had four times the calcium and water soluble vitamins and minerals of the American diet of his day in the 1930s. So just imagine the difference now. Um, at least in the US, well, we are overfed and undernourished. These people were properly nourished, and they had their diets had 10 times the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins as a modern American diet of his day. How did Dr. Price know this? He actually sent samples back to his lab in Ohio for analysis. And he picked it apart because he wanted to know what did they get that we weren't getting anymore. And I will tell you one thing that he also did. He decided to do a little experiment with school children. I guess he was just so distressed about their state that he decided just to give them one good meal a day. I think he would make like a beef stew and give them sourdough bread with a lot of butter, probably raw milk, I'm guessing. And with that one meal, the children's health improved, their behavior improved. It just would turn them around. So he knew he was on to something. Um, they had a mix of cooked and raw foods and high levels of enzymes and beneficial bacteria. So, as you were saying, that sauerkraut or the fermented foods were, were critical and part of every traditional diet. So again, the key finding is nutrient density. So where can we find nutrient density? But the main thing is that we, our bodies, our brains, our cellular function demands a, D, E, and K, these vitamins that come from, particularly from animal products. And when we deprive ourselves of them, we are going to find ourselves in chronic health conditions. And I'm not speaking as a doctor, but I'm speaking as a person who has studied the work of Dr. Price and interviewed experts all around the world, including those who have left their vegetarian diet because they found that they were experiencing the physical degeneration that Dr. Price has spoken of. But what you can be sure of is that they were looking for nutrient density, which genuinely is found in animal products. So I want to conclude by just saying, if you're wondering where to start, choose nutrient dense foods. Personally, I started with butter. I think the next year, literally I spent a year on butter, was avoiding processed foods. So little by little, I worked my way through the Western Price Foundation principles, and our family is enjoying such good health. And I'm so grateful to have the health and energy to bring this message to you today. Embrace facts. The very things we've been told to avoid in the United States, and even in this country as well, are the things that we should be embracing. And by the way, if I can just tell you one... <laughs> I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, theory person, but um, some people suspect that there's a reason we're being told not to eat these things. It makes for a more compliant and pliable and naive population 
when you're basically starving your cell, your brain cells, you know? So I'm just saying. So I will just conclude now, since my laptop has slipped off, maybe that's a sign of me. Um, consume whole real foods. Don't be afraid of fats, animal products, the things that are really going to nourish your body. And I will conclude with a quote from Dr. Price, which is, Life in all its fullness is Mother Nature obeyed.